I starve my demons by feasting on boredom. Hmm, what an interesting concept. Hey, let me first start by saying thanks for continuing to watch as I move in back into stand-up comedy. Uh, this channel is going to change a little bit, but it allows me to talk to you about more than just stand-up. Things that may help your life, from my own experience. It's still all stand-up related, but you'll find that um, stand-up is just kind of the delivery method for a lot of other bits of philosophy, wisdom. There's so much in life. It's, it's like that book that I never read, Zen and the Art of um, Motorcycle Fixing or something like that correct me in the comments, but it's not really about motorcycles. It's about life. And what do we do with stand-up? We examine things. We break things down. We point out the inconsistencies, things that work, things that don't work. So uh, I starve my demons. One of the things, and part of this is me getting older. I'm sure it's a drop in my testosterone, but I used to be wild when I was younger. I got in probably 50 fights. Um, I've been arrested five times for fighting, like the name of that band. People think I'm making it up. I don't want an affiliation with that band. I don't even know what their songs are. But I, I put myself through a lot. And so I want to cover two topics about this and tell you about what I'm doing for the open mic that's coming up. That's the third part. The first part is dealing with my demons. I was always searching for something else. Enough was never enough. And it didn't matter if I had money, didn't have money. It's easier when you have money because you're not... Uh... Well, maybe it's not, now that I think about it. Because when I don't have money, I'm in survival mode. And that takes me out of my intellectual problems that I create somehow in my mind. The, the existential ennui, if you will be so kind as to endeavor such a phrase. Um, yeah, so when I was in college and then for many years, probably all the way up to my 40s, I would go out with my buddies to a bar or go out by myself, and if it wasn't popping, if there wasn't enough going on, if there weren't enough beautiful women, I'd say, let's go to another bar. Always searching. Always searching for an after hours. Always searching for some excitement. And it got me into a lot of weird situations, a lot of sketchy environments. And, you know, always looking for that that next thing, hanging out. I mean, I could romanticize it. I hung out with Dabney Coleman one time at an after hours uh, at like four in the morning that this guy named Mouse ran. And I didn't know Mouse, but he was an interesting character. Uh, I think that's what drew me to stand-up as well. Um Besides the need to be liked and appreciated by people and wanting to show off, it was exciting. And I don't know, they say that uh, a lot of the world's problems could be solved if men could just sit quietly in a room by themselves. And that's what I've done the last couple of years. I've cut myself off intentionally from a lot of external stimuli. And yes, I would scroll on Twitter and Facebook and, and those types of things, but um, I intentionally made my life boring because I always feared boredom. That's, that was the driving force in my life. I needed something. I needed anything. What I can't. I couldn't be alone with myself because my thoughts would race. You know, for many years, I was literally afraid of meditating because my thought was 
Well, there's something inside of my brain that suppresses a whole bunch of the thoughts or memories. And I don't want to unlock Pandora's box by meditating. <laughs> so the one time I, I, the first time I tried meditating, I got one, this is how long ago, it was a cassette. And I decided to listen to a guided meditation um, on an airplane. Boy, was that not a great first time to try that out. Being confined on an airplane. I had to like take it, take the tape out. I wanted to break it there. It was not. You know, this, I'm packed in here. There's all these people. Thankfully, I wasn't in a middle seat. But boy, oh boy, that made me not, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that made me not want to meditate for many years. Um, you know those exercises to focus on your breathing? That screwed my breathing up. Like not even the meditation, just doing that. Whenever somebody brings up, like focus on your breathing, I start hyperventilating. I don't know what to do with myself because it's it's not something I think about. It happens subconsciously. You just breathe. And I had a hard time just being at peace, being boring, living a boring life. And so, again, it comes back to reframing. The last couple of years, I was very depressed. I was as I've said numerous times, taking four to six hour a day naps. Um, so I could look at that as tragic, but it kind of was like the crucible. It burned off a lot of the stuff that I used to be concerned and worried about. And now I'm left with some sense of peace and tranquility. I don't have any desire to do the things that I used to do. The desire to drink alcohol now, it's, it's uh, nine and a half years. It's going on 10 years in June. It'll be 10 years. I have no desire at all. I mean, it's just, it's crazy to me that I have ever drank the way that I did. Um, no desire to do hardcore substances. There's one other substance that I do late at night. It helps me sleep. I feel like I'm a little bit more creative. It, it loosens me up. It's legal now. I'm not going to mention it. I'm sure you can figure it out. It's the funny little cigarettes that make music sound better. Um, but yeah, I, I needed to go through what I went through. And it's not Pollyanna, rose-colored rose glasses. I really feel like I'm at peace with myself. I like who I am. I enjoy my own company now, which is a big difference than the guy trying to drag his friends to every single bar in a city. Oh, no, this one will work. This one will be better. The girls will be hotter. They'll like me. They'll be into me. This is the, the music sucks here. We got to go here. We're, it was always searching for external validation. And that's one of the things that in stand-up, I would do, I would go big and um, a lot of energy, a lot of movement, because I was afraid that they weren't going to laugh, that they weren't going to like me, that I wasn't going to be as good as the next comic or the one before me. So I overcompensated, and I wasn't confident enough in my material. That's why I talk so much about writing, because I think about the performance side, it's, it's half of the equation. It's super important. Um, but that's kind of the dressing up of the material. You have to make the, sure the material looks good nude as well. And so my style developed more into me just going up, sitting on the stool before everybody and their brother started doing that. Um, I wasn't the first, obviously. There were plenty of people who did that prior to me. But now I just I see it a lot. Um, but I would just sit there with my back against the wall and just talk. And very casual. Because I knew 
I had certain material, especially, that I could stretch out. I could create that tension in the audience's mind and then release it with a killer punchline. That was the confidence I had. It's, it's kind of like I, how I do these videos. So I, I'm telling you that because I do know that a lot of comedians deal with those types of issues. One of the things, looking back, so this is the second part. Looking back on my life, the least depressed I was, the happiest I was, that's a better way of saying it, but the most productive I was as well, was when I had the most I had to do. It was 11th grade of high school, it started in August, September, and I think October, maybe a little bit of November. It's when I was playing football because I had to go to school super early. Then I had to do all my classes and then go and do football practice. And then after that, go home and do my homework. My schedule was so packed that... I was just getting stuff done because I had to go to the next thing. I didn't have time to put things off. The more you have to do, the more you get done. A lot of comics do jokes about um, how they mailed the letter today, and that seemed like a huge accomplishment. It's because we, don't, we have a lot of free time. You're on stage, let's say you're a headliner. You're on stage for an hour a day. What do you do with the rest of the time? Especially when you're on the road. I mean, I'll make a video about that, things you can do on the road to keep yourself occupied. Um, you can be writing and rehearsing and all that, but let's deal with reality. Most comics don't do that. Outside of the travel to get to the gig... Um, you might be there for a week in a hotel. And so you get stir crazy because you don't have a lot of stuff to do. And that's why I remember I was writing a ton of material when I had a day job because I only had a window of time that I could write the material and rehearse it. And so that time became precious to me. When I, it's like having an assignment in school that's not due for a month. And so, as most people do, I would wait until the night before and then cram. And I did well because I was smart, but it's not an effective way to do it. And so what happens? By putting it all off until the last minute, when I finally get it done, I feel euphoric. I'm like, yes, it's done. But all that time leading up to it, I didn't enjoy. I had anxiety because that, that project or that paper was always weighing on me. It was always like, ugh. The same when I was ghostwriting. I would have to turn in scenes to the screenwriter, but I would wait until 11 o'clock at night to start. And then I would do it. It would only take me like an hour. And I'd be like, yes. But then, all right, it's like 12, 30, 1 in the morning. And I got to get up and do it the whole next day. And I would repeat the pattern instead of getting it done early and enjoying the rest of the day. And today is a great example. It's Sunday. I usually film these at 8 o'clock at night, the night before they air. But I have a dinner to go to at my cousin's house, the ones that took me in halfway through high school. And they're going to have a, a birthday cake. And so I'm like, all right, well, that happens at 4. We're going to eat at 4. And uh, if I rush out of there, 
It seems impolite. I don't want to be gone from my dogs for too long, but what if I did the video early, like at one o'clock, and and get it done? Not even get it out of the way. I'm putting just as much time and effort and energy into this as I would any other time. But man, if I get this done, then I'm not I'm not worried about it for the rest of the evening. I can actually enjoy myself. And if I get home at an appropriate time to make another video, I can do that. And I could bank one for a change. Because I, I know that as my schedule gets busier, it'll be nice to have a video that I can release. Because I feel like if I don't release one every day, while I don't have a lot of regular viewers, I the ones that are... I'm going to feel like you're going to worry, what happened? Why doesn't he have a video today? And, you know, some of that may be codependency or people-pleasing, whatever. That's how I am. I've come to terms with it. So you might find that if you stack your schedule with a lot of stuff to do and you actually do that stuff, It'll lighten your mood. You won't be as concerned about trivial things. Just like when I'm in survival mode, I'm worried about making my mortgage. I'm not thinking, oh, I need to set this whole thing up for eBay so it's this system where I can just go in. No, I'm just taking items, I'm taking photos, I'm taking measurements, and I'm listing it. And then I'm doing the next one, and then I'm doing the next one. And I'm not worried about if, uh, if someone's mad at me. It's usually what I'm worried about, if somebody's disappointed in me or mad at me. It's such a crazy thing. And that's why I enjoy hanging out with Gavin so much. He doesn't give a fuck. Like, <laughs> if, if you get a chance to know him, if he allows me to put him in more videos... He's really funny because he's so opposite of me in that regard. Same with, with my beloved friend, Sam Brown, who was a comedian and screenwriter, had a lot of success writing spec scripts with his writing partner, sold one for, I think, a million dollars. Owen Williams, uh, Owen Wilson was supposed to star in it, but, you know, he went through some troubles. Sadly, Sam passed from cancer uh, some years ago, but Sam Brown, he, he used to do shows at Luna Park and right after the shows that I ran with my other friends and they were bringer shows, but there were industry there. They were great comics. They needed great tapes. He would go up, he'd give himself the best spot while everybody else was doing eight minutes. He'd go in there and do 45 and I used to sit in there and watch it because just that concept is so bonkers to me. That well, why are you doing forty-five? And so I asked him one day, and he would like literally schedule it so that um, he would just have a few go up that maybe didn't have a lot of people there, and then the comics that had a lot of people there they would go after his forty-five minutes, and so it was kind of like he was holding the audience hostage, and would barricade the doors in a sense. He said, hey, look, I'm running this room. I have to pay the $250 to rent the room. Yeah, comics are bringing their friends and they're getting people here and it eventually covers it, but there's sometimes it doesn't cover it. Why am I doing all of this? So I can just be one of the comics that doesn't have to do all this? Why, why wouldn't I give myself the benefit? And there was a guy in my fraternity, again, this may seem normal to you, but to me it was mind-blowing. It was revolutionary. A guy in my fraternity at SUNY Potsdam, he had a Jeep. And to have any vehicle in college was crazy, enough as it is. But he had, one day he rolled up, he was a couple years older, and he had sheepskin uh, seat covers. And I'm like dude, that had to be crazy expensive. This was in the 90s. 
So I'm like, what? And he looked at me and he said, if you're not good to yourself, who's going to be? And I was like, oh, man, this is going to stick with me for 30 years. Tater K, how's your day? I don't like using people's real names on this because I don't want to blow their anonymity even when I'm complimenting them. But yeah, you got to put yourself first and do contrary action. Do the opposite, like George Costanza, opposite day. Do things that you wouldn't normally do. Break free of some of these habits. And so I'm getting ready for this open mic. While I have to figure out what my long-term goals are, there's a lot of prep I want to do to figure out a game plan, which I'll share with you about what I want for my future and how to get there. And there's a video about this, about goal setting. I refer back to this a lot, the Susie Soro video. You can type that into the search. Um, but writing out your, Wik- your own Wikipedia entry or your own obituary and saying, okay, you know, he did stadiums or he had five specials, whatever the goal is, and then working backward one step. Okay, if I want to have five, five specials, what do I need to do? Well, the step before that is I need to have four specials. And then the step before that, and go back and back and back and back and back until you bring yourself to present day. Yeah, it takes some time, it takes some effort, but I mean, you're designing your life. So as I'm going through that process for not just stand up, but clearing out my house, uh, repairing my house, getting my health fixed, getting money, and really pumping stuff out on eBay, Uh, I have an immediate goal, which is today is Sunday. You're watching this on Monday. My evening is kind of booked for tonight. I got to come up with five minutes of material, brand new material for the open mic on Thursday. So effectively, that gives me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday, part of Thursday during the day. So we'll say I have four full days. To come up with five minutes. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to write every day. So I can't focus too much on some of the other things because I have to get this done. It's a, an immediate deadline. That's why goals with deadlines are very important. It's why I push you in the comments all the time. Hey, If you say, I've always wanted to do stand-up, I say, okay, commit to it. When will you do it? Because when you have that open mic, you have to live into that future. You have to get stuff done. Because otherwise, I want to do an open mic someday. You can put that off for years. So, excuse me. I I have two ways that I'm going to do this. I'm going to write. I'm also going through Facebook. Um, Facebook Memories has been great because it's brought up some of my statuses of things. Some of it wasn't that funny or it was just funny for that period of time. But I'm going through and finding things that I wrote that I never did as a bit. And I'm going to work on those as well. I think combining those two is going to be great. And I'll probably do the index cards so I don't have to worry as much about memorization or performance. It's another video where I talk about using index cards, reading the joke, getting a response, going on to the next joke. Because this way I can get a a gauge of my material on a, a baseline. That's what Rodney Dangerfield used to do Sunday nights at his club, Dangerfield's. He would take a stack of index cards with all his new jokes and just read them. And whatever got the best response, they stayed in. And then he would develop them from there. So that's probably what I'm going to do. 
unless I'm able to get the material down pat by using some of the tips and the other videos of how to memorize your act in an easy way, sing song it out like you're doing the ABCs or recording it. All right, Willie, almost done. Five more minutes. Recording it and then playing it in my headphones while I go about my day and saying it along with that. And then acting it out in front of a mirror or in front of my phone and recording it. So there's a whole bunch of different ways I can do this. And I'll, I'll show you which one I choose as I'm approaching this because I want to keep making videos. Hopefully these are still interesting to you. Hopefully you're, you're getting even more out of this because I feel like you know me to some degree after a hundred videos. I've been pretty consistent in who I am. I, I don't even know. That sounds weird. I, I'm just myself. Somebody wrote a comment um, about the Seinfeld system. They're like, get to the point, get to the point, get to the point. Okay, thumbs down. You didn't get to the, this guy's not getting to the point. Yeah, it's, I do these videos the way that I feel comfortable. It's not just bullet points. And I don't, there's, there's a way you can do these videos where it gets people to watch the whole thing. I'm going to give you 10 ways to deal with bombing. And then I did 11, but I didn't have like, um, and I only did that one time, but it wasn't to like keep you watching. It was like, no, I can think of 11 of them and I didn't have the bullet points written out. That's, those are the things that you do to keep retention. I ramble. I try to do it in one take because it's more authentic. When I make a mistake, when my voice sounds a little scratchy, and I need to clear my throat or take a sip of coffee. Hey, this is my vlog. This is me um, trying to help you and also help myself and document all of this. So that's it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. And wish me luck as I start to stack uh, work on top of myself so that I get to a point where the more I have to do, the more I get done. Now that I've starved my demons by feasting on boredom.